So we're here today with uh, former Secretary of Education, Margaret Spellings. And uh, Margaret, thank you for joining us. Right now, there are so many uh, pressures on fiscal budgets for governments around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, education is just one of many priorities that governments have to fund. How do you think education is faring in this uh, resource allocation debate? Well, I think we're seeing all over the world, and certainly here in the U.S., uh, tensions between uh, investments on, on behalf of the elderly and investments on behalf of, of the next generation, young children and kids in school and university students and, and on and on. And those tensions are acute around the world. And I think it's, uh, you know, we're, governments and policy bodies are, are having to weigh those investments. Uh, but we're in an era that we're going to have to do more with less. We've got to figure out ways to be more productive in all of our public institutions. And I think we're going to do that through more data, more information, and better understanding uh, those processes and try to wring out some efficiencies. What are some of the trends that you see happening that will impact education? Well, to date, as you know, Jay, we've invested a lot of money in technology with very little return uh, to the good uh, on student achievement. Uh, you know, that's, that's true, really, I think, around the world. Um, and so we're, I hope we're about to go to the next level. And, you know, I think some, uh, some governments around the world uh, have figured out better uh, how to invest in technology and have it deployed and scalable in ways that, frankly, are more efficient uh, and more, uh, more productive than, than we do here in the U.S. I mean, but I think we're going to see overall a couple of things. We're going to see more personalization and customization of learning. We're going to see assessment, testing embedded within uh, instruction. Uh, we're going to see the teacher become more of a facilitator and a diagnoser and a corrector because there will be more rapid feedback uh, than we've had to date. When you talk about you know, some of the constraints or legacy models, do you have um, any recommendations for how we think about affecting change, uh, you know, given some of those constraints? Well, I think uh, what I've seen and, and what we do not do very well here, here in the U.S. is uh, finding ways to leverage public sector investments in ways that inspire uh, innovation and capital investment in the private sector. I mean, we in government, no matter what country you're in, cannot invest enough money to inspire and spur and correct, uh, you know, innovation and, and have technological products come to market, market quickly enough without accessing private sector investment. One of the things that you mentioned uh, was that that budgets are tight now and that we're increasingly going to have to figure out how to do more with less. Is there pain coming as a result of that or is there opportunity embedded in this push for greater return on the investment dollar? I think we're, we're in a shrinking, uh, shrinking resource environment and so school administrators, teachers, technologists, uh, parents, we're going to have to figure out how to be smarter and more efficient about it. And that is an opportunity, you know, things that I think the next big thing in, in policy around the world and here is productivity. Okay, so now that we've, there's really kind of a worldwide uh, acceptance of accountability, of assessment and transparency, this need to close the achievement gap, but I also think that we're, uh, we're in a time when we have to start thinking about how we invest dollars against those uh, those student achievement benchmarks and markers. How much does it cost to run the third grade versus the fourth grade? How much is science versus English? How much is high school versus middle school? How are we organized? All of the things that, uh, that would be implicated in that, really we've, we don't even know. We've barely begun to ask the question. What do you see as the top priorities facing uh, U.S. education today? Well, clearly, uh, the, the achievement gap, this, this you know, woeful underachievement uh, by the system generally and certainly as it provides or doesn't provide uh, educational services to, to poor and minority and disadvantaged kids. And I think it's just, it's the raging fire, as I call it, uh, in education. And it's really untenable. And um, one of the things I'm so troubled by now is this dis discussions in Congress and even sometimes at the state and local levels really uh, are, are away from that that major imperative that that you know 
audacious goal that we set a little more than 10 years ago to do that work. Now we see, you know, waivers from states with pledges to educate half, I mean 85 percent of Hispanics or cut the achievement gap in half irrespective of what it means for large numbers of students left behind or, and ill-equipped to, to be competitive. So, I mean, I worry that we might have sort of given up and, and now are saying, well, I guess we can't really educate every child to, to higher levels, and it's a, it's a sad day. How, how important is this issue for the continued competitiveness of the U.S.? Well, I think it's absolutely essential, and I, and I think, you know, we know that intuitively, intuitively, we know that in our own lives that, you know, but for education, uh, we'd, much, we'd have a, a harder road to hoe. We see that, you know, in the numbers uh, that there are many millions of, of uh, unfilled jobs today in this country with high unemployment rates that go lacking for, uh, for skilled workers. So by every measure, it, it kind of bombards us. Uh, we see our kids uh, come home and live with us after they graduate from college because they may or may not have skills that are, that are relevant uh, for the marketplace. I mean, there's a lot of signs that, of, about the importance uh, of this in a global knowledge economy. Let, let's talk a little bit about the role that business leaders can play. You know, what role do you think is, is optimal for them? Well, I think uh, the business community uh, ought to be what is sometimes called a critical partner uh, in, in all senses of, of, that, of that phrase. Critical uh, in the sense that it calls out underachievement. Uh, it's uh, the, the tough-minded, table-pounding, you know, advocate for change when, when, it, when we need change, and we need a lot of change if we're going to really meet the challenges of the global economy. But it's also a partner uh, when it comes time to invest around uh, things that work and build a community engagement and uh, be a responsible party on behalf of young people in the community. Uh, I, will, I will say that, you know, my experience is where a business community has been organized and informed and has had, you know, some, some staying power, those are the places that we're moving the needle. You mentioned vocational education. Uh, is this an area that you think uh, merits more attention, uh, not just in the U.S., but, it, but even on a global basis? Well, well, I think it does. Uh, you know, we have millions, uh, 3.2 million jobs, the Department of Labor tells us, that are unfilled today because of a lack of qualified, skilled workers to fill them. And I think, you know, we have to sort of reframe our thinking about vocational education, and we need to foster more employer partnerships so that those, those, that those linkages between education and, and the marketplace, the employer, uh, can be much more um, more defined and much more uh, uh, efficient for students to access. Well, th thank you again for all of your efforts on behalf of of kids that are trying to get a better shot, uh, and and we really appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thank you.